Sarah, I appreciate you participating in that. Um, today, um, the consultants that are going to be working with you and facilitating, um, one is myself, Chris Pelfrey, and uh, another one is Kelly Stukas. And Kelly, if you could say hello, because I don't know if you're on the screen or not. I'm on the screen here, Chris. Thank you. So I know you spent some time with Michael first and then with Michael and Jennifer um, as we're on our journey through lessons learned from quarantine. Um, this installment is gonna be on assessment and feedback. If you take a look at the cartoon there, right? We're gonna need some more specific feedback. And that's really about all the feedback I give my dog and I am loaning him out currently for anybody that is wanting or you know would like to see what it's like to own a dog for an extended, extended period of time. I'd be happy to do that. Chris, we uh, could make it a twofer. Yeah, yeah, you got a dog like I do. I know, I agree. I do. So just to kind of recap and review some Zoom norms, and again, the important part here, not only when you're in a meeting and you're facilitating a meeting, but also, and more importantly, with your students, you're going to want to establish those routines, those protocols, and to kind of help bake that culture in um, as you're getting them to invest in their learning. So these are just some examples that we're going to try to adhere to as we work through this um, session today, but raising hands, you can't hear, right? Thumbs up, I understand. And then as always, please utilize your camera when possible to get it as synchronous as possible, and then make sure that your mics are muted. So today's learning intentions. We have two, and we have a lot to get to. Um, Kelly and I have been working hard planning this, so we're gonna see how much we can get through in an hour. Um, <laughs> outcome number one, teacher clarity enables the development of assessment capable learners. And we're gonna talk about what that is and what it is to be an assessment capable learner. And then outcome two, I can use the information from formative assessments to adjust my feedback based on the specific learning intentions and success criteria, which was introduced by Michael and then Michael and Jennifer. Well, Chris, you skipped one. You wanna go back and talk about re review? There it is, yeah. Life? Yeah, and I appreciate you telling me that because one remote is not really working. I don't know if you can see the remote in my hand. It's yeah. working, not working, so this is going to be interesting at the moment. It's all um, right. It's real life. Yeah, and to kind of go back to synchronous that I just mentioned in asynchronous communication, just as a review, synchronous is that communication that happens in real time, and asynchronous is a communication that doesn't happen in real time. Now, communication is one thing, but I want to kind of turn the viewpoint or the lens onto how you are facilitating your lessons um, during this crisis. So I, I want you to keep in mind that a good balance, and really I would lean towards more synchronous communication and more synchronous lessons as much as possible with your students, as opposed to asynchronous communication. So asynchronous is when they're doing things all on their own and not getting that, that quick and valuable feedback from you that we're gonna talk about, and synchronous lessons or synchronous instruction allows for that more um, real-time feedback or feedback opportunities. So when we think about the synchronous lesson, when our students arrive on Zoom or when they arrive in Google Hangout, we need to think about structure. So we took this from the National Association of Elementary School Principals on the way you can run a Zoom meeting or a Google Hangout, looking at how you would divide the time in your lesson. So students arrive, as Chris says, you set the norms, and then your, could le your lesson could be divided into these components. You might include a pre-assignment, you might not, depending on what your purpose is. If you're working with older children, you might want them to have come um, investigating a picture or reading a pre-assignment. Then you have a warm-up. Included in your warm-up is a time where you could incorporate a retrieval practice where students are retrieving previous learning, so we make sure that it's in transfers into long-term memory. Or during the warm-up, you might be doing something to build background knowledge for your lesson and for assignments to come. The bulk of your virtual uh, meetup would include 50% of teaching, um, so that would be the bulk of when you're instructing on the purpose that you're looking uh, for the students to take away. Then 20% is the feedback. Every single time we meet in our synchronous environment, there's gonna be feedback of some sort. And we'll investigate the different ways that we can incorporate this feedback today. And then finally, we always wanna leave our students or our participants with the next steps or the key takeaways. So the last thing that they heard from us is the thing we want them to remember. 
So let's review where Michael and Jennifer have taken us. First, we talked about teacher clarity, and no other time has teacher clarity been more important than now, because we know that we cannot take our pacing guides as they are and try to incorporate them into this virtual environment. We need to be specific on what are the essential learning targets or standards that we want to make sure students retain. So knowing when we're clear on what we want to teach, it has an effect size of 0.75. And as we learned earlier, anything with an effect size of 0.40 or better is worth replicating in our brick and mortar classroom or in a virtual setting. We also want to prioritize, as I mentioned before, for clarity, knowing that we have to know what are we gonna teach. And we know that we're gonna have gaps as students come back to us in the fall, and they might be coming back to us in a, a virtual setting. So how are we gonna plug those gaps? And by prioritizing, that will help us have a chance to fight those gaps. And finally, we talked about what does proficiency look like? And our discussion was on success criteria, not making it for our students so that they know, number one, where they're going by knowing the learning target, and then they'll know along the way how they're doing because they know what success looks like. But we want to have a misconception alert. Just as we know that writing an I can, can statement up on the chalkboard does not further a student's learning, we need to think about how we make sure that students attach these learning targets to themselves so they understand it's not about the activity that they're completing, but it's about the absolute target we're trying to hit. This has implications in the virtual settings as well. We need to make sure our students know exactly what we're trying to accomplish in our learning. So we need to make connections for students. This be can be done using words, pictures, actions, some combination of the three, but it's done all the time and it's done with intention. So four parts of the learning target that work together to describe learning for a lesson involves number one, our students know what the learning they're trying to accomplish. We know that we can't take our lessons the way we used to and blitz them in a Zoom call. They have to be in bite-sized manual pieces. So we need to think about this learning differently and in increments that are smaller than what we're used to. So that takes some strategic planning. We will also want to provide students with opportunities to measure their progress and learn the, along the way. So it's not just I give an activity and then I get a grade. We're along the way talking about how we're progressing towards our learning target. And we can do that when we create our student look force so that students are invested in this learning because they have a bigger part in this virtual environment than they've ever had before. They need to know where they are in relation to accomplishing the target that you set for. All right, so the first outcome that we're going to take a look at a little bit more deeply is teacher clarity enables the development of assessment capable learners. And when we're thinking about this, learners need to know the route they're on and the feedback needs to guide them to their destination. So I like this GPS gauging the progress of students. So once we set the destination, then we need to have opportunities to respond to offer learners multiple pathways for actively progressing toward that destination. When we think about Hattie's work, and we're all pretty immersed in Hattie's work now, and I really like this because it reminds me of a Speedo in a car for the miles per hour. When you think at 0 .40, like or 0.40, like Kelly mentioned, as the ideal or you know the, the average effect size that we're kind of looking for, we don't want to be below that, and we don't want to be, you know, and we absolutely want to be above it, excuse me. So when you're thinking about assessment-capable learners, and you think about this as a Speedo in a car, or miles per hour, it is pegging it, right, at 1.44, which in a sense is, is tripling the potential impact on students learning and or growth which is more important over the course of a year so i don't know if you remember sarah from the last time but we wanted to bring sarah back um, and, and talk about her in a little different way this time as it applies to assessment capable learners so we're going to watch it and then we're going to discuss it a little bit here and we'll see how this all goes Sarah, can you tell us how this chart works? We'll point to them and tell us about it. I know nobody's on this, but some people might not be on this. How come? Because some people won't do that because we're in kindergarten. But some people might do that. Good. Now go further up the chart and tell us about the middle of it, Sarah, around the orange crate. Well, some people sound it out and try and make their letters neat on this one. 
Good. And what about further up the chart, Sarah? Then what happens? On this one, they try to sound it out. They try to make the letters neatly and try to make the thing right. This is where I am. I sound it out. I try to keep them nicely written. I try to make the right words. I try to keep the letters with a space before they start. And I'm going over to here because it's the last step and I'm over at the nine step. This is the 10 step. Sarah, can you So when we think about, as soon as I get control of my slide deck here. When we think about Sarah as assessment capable learner, right? She is the central character in this formative learning cycle. She's able to um, really articulate where she's at, what the learning intention is, and where she's going and what her goals are. So that self-assessment, that's the ultimate test of students' ownership of their own learning. So when we think about internalizing the target, the learning intention that is, and the success criteria will equal that learning that we're looking for for our students. So we move on with, you know, what makes up an assessment capable learner. So, you know, where am I going? Students know what they're learning and it makes sense to them. Students know what quality work looks like, um, where I am now. It is clear to the student what they are doing well on and what they are need to do next. And I just had this conversation with my daughter this morning. Um, students self-assess and set their own learning goals and where to go next. I know what my next step is in learning. So just to kind of recap in a little different way, assessment capable learners, they know their current level of understanding. They're able to identify. They know where they're going and are confident to take the challenge and select the tools that they need in order to guide their learning. The other thing that assessment capable learners do that really you know, can help us is they seek that feedback and recognize errors as opportunities to learn. And that's something we need to work with our students to understand that you know, if they do miss something, that's an opportunity to learn. As adults, we know that's when the learning takes place, but we need to make sure that our students understand that. The other part there is monitor their progress and adjust their learning as they see, you know, like how can I take um, agency for myself in order to adjust my learning so that I can be successful and then recognize their learning and teach others is what an assessment capable learner can do. So when we think about assessment capable, capable, we have to think about how do we create this mindset for our students in our classroom? Because we've seen evidence of what it looks like when a student is not assessment capable. They use strategies that involve avoidance. Do you have that student that's always asking to go to the bathroom? I know these students, I had them in my classroom too. They are avoiding including themselves in the equation because they believe they don't have the ability. They don't believe in themselves. So they might quit easily. They might not think they're smart enough and they might be in the bathroom all the time. If they're not assessment capable, they also might be just concerned with the points in the grades. When is this due? How much is this worth? We call these compliance school experts that rear their heads around fifth grade, like what's in it for me, right? How do I get a grade and how do I get on with it? It's not about the learning, it's about the grade. When a student does see themselves as assessment capable, they know it's about the learning. And again, these conditions are what's set up in our classroom, the mindsets that we frame for our students by presenting the success criteria and helping our students to recognize that learning is a journey, it is not a destination, and that mistakes are going to happen. And so how do we deal with mistakes in our classrooms? Is there a chance to redo it, to re-understand something? Because the end goal is mastery of that standard. So reflection is part of this assessment capable uh, learner. So we wanna provide opportunities within our classrooms for students to assess where they are related to their destination. If we're working on a standard, am I novice at this time? I'm just starting to learn this. Do I perceive myself as an apprentice, a practitioner, an expert? And I'm gonna be checking in as the facilitator as what statement best describes you as we continue on our learning. 
I can also do this through exit slips. And my exit slips can be sorted into categories just like the ones that you're seeing on the screen. I'm just learning, I'm almost there, I own it, I'm a pro. And although you're seeing physical tubs that apply to our bricks and mortar classrooms, they can also be um, submitted to you virtually, whether you're using a Google form, a Google doc, an email, whatever medium you prefer. And we have one more example here. Um, what, did I did what, what did I do well on? What do I need to practice? And what do I still need my teacher to teach me and help with? What better way for you to gain formative assessment from a reflection check-in like this to help you know as the instructor what your next step should be? And, and I'm glad you brought that up, Kelly, though, about brick and mortar or in the virtual setting. Everything that we're trying to, to talk about today and demonstrate, we want you to you know, think about the flexibility that some of these offer that allow you to have them in a virtual or in a brick and mortar um, environment. And that's really what it's going to take next year with all the um, unknowns that we're facing moving forward is how quickly can we be flexible? How agile are we um, in our instruction and in our formative assessments and our feedback to be able to go back and forth if we're in the classroom for a couple of days and then we have to go back to virtual? How is that going to transition? And really, how can we leverage some of these formative assessments that might happen um, in a virtual setting as opportunities to, for really deep learning and understanding once we get back in the classroom? So one thing I want you to take a look at here is an assessment capable learner kind of check in, if you will. So this is an example or a scenario. I want you to, to give it a read or we could do a, we could do a choral read, but that would be a, a little confusing and a little loud. But we could do it, you know, whisper choral read just as I read, if you don't mind. So Chris is using a rubric his teacher gave him as he looks over the social studies biography he has just written. He sees that he needs to add a section to describe Thomas Jefferson's early life. So he makes a plan to revise his biography to include it. So if you wouldn't mind, and we would appreciate it, please use the chat box and tell us, is Chris an assessment capable learner and why, or is he not a capable learner, assessment capable learner and why? We'll take about two minutes to do this. So I can see the chat box is filling up, but I cannot see the actual chat box at the moment. So I'm going to rely on Kelly. I copy. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's scroll up here and see what we've got. Um, someone says, yes, he's an assessment capable learner because he is self-reflecting, noticing how he can improve his writing and make a plan. Someone says he's not. He's just using a rubric to make sure he has all the parts for the grade. Mm, one can, yes, one could argue that he's just compliant. Yes, he self-checks and makes a plan to fix it. Uh, the final one, he's an assessment capable learner because he reflects on what he still needs to do and has a plan to revise. Excellent. And just so you're aware, Kelly and I did select this one because it, it does, in a sense, ride the line of assessment uh, capable learner or not. Um, and we thought it might provide or provoke some good conversation and some good discussion in the chat box. Um, and this is one of those things that we have to really think about with our students and what they're doing. But more importantly, what we are setting up for their learning intentions, setting up for their success criteria, and then how are we scaffolding that their learning opportunities or their opportunities to respond as we move through um, the unit so they can become or have opportunities to become assessment capable learners. Chris, I also wonder the use of the rubric. I mean, when is the rubric brought out? Are student exemplars shown before we begin writing? How often am I provided the opportunity to, to remember my rubric and check back in on it? So it doesn't become, okay, it's the final day of the paragraph, get your rubrics out, and then it becomes like the rubric event where everyone's over their writing and they just put their check marks down. 
Absolutely. And I think that kind of circles back to the success criteria in my mind of when we're introducing the success criteria and we compare that with the rubric to show this is what an exemplar looks like and let's utilize the rubric as a tool so we can compare and contrast what it might look like and then what our writing looks like based on that. So you bring up a great point um, on the front end to make sure that we're looking at those rubrics to help guide them. So outcome two, I can use information from formative assessments to adjust my feedback based on the specific learning intentions and success criteria. So mastery learning model, to, to me this really kind of, I'm very visual. So in my mind, this is how we can achieve this and kind of start this conversation is, is thinking about the mastery learning model. So we, we pre-assess and we're not gonna really get into pre-assessment, but if you are pre-assessing, I just ask that you know the purpose. Um, Kelly and I have this saying is know thy purpose of pre-assessment. So what are what is your intended outcome for the pre-assessment? Um, it should not be just because this is part of the class and I'm gonna give them a pre-assessment. I already know what they're gonna do. They know what they're gonna do and they're gonna fail it. You, you really need to know what your intention is and the purpose of your pre-assessment. Then you have your instruction and then you provide a formative assessment or opportunity to respond. If they are successful, then they can move into enrichment. If they need correction, they can move to a corrective or an intervention. And this is really, really why I like formative assessments. We talk about it all the time, you know, it, it drives our instruction, it informs our instruction. Well, how does it inform our instruction? Here's an example with this visual of how it can inform your instruction. Formative assessments are meant to be corrective measures, right? You can course correct with them. Either you can go into an intervention opportunity or you can go into an enrichment opportunity and then pre-assess again. You can kind of see how this works. And I love blended learning for this or the virtual learning. I think that um, I see this as an opportunity to be honest with you. Uh, when we're at home and we're, we're providing these more individualized lessons when we go asynchronous or even in an asynchronous environment, I really think that this is a model that we can kind of push forward with a little bit more ease than we could in a brick and mortar environment. So, and we like this one too, right? When a chef tastes a soup, it's formative. When a guest tastes a soup, it's summative, right? And this goes back to that whole corrective measure. So when it, you're tasting the soup and you're looking at it from the teacher's perspective, right? I assess my students, I give them a formative assessment, um, and I notice they're not doing well. So I have to reflect back on my instruction and I have to determine an action. What, am I needing, what do I need to improve? What do I need to adjust? Do I need to you know, rethink how I'm delivering this and then move forward again? For the students, right, and if they're assessment capable, it gives them an opportunity as a check-in to see where they're at on that progression as they're working towards mastery of that learning intention because by the time they get to the summative, it's just to check on what they know at that point. And if you do formative assessments um, often enough or opportunities to respond often enough and um, with fidelity and, you're, and they're tied to your learning intention, you're gonna be able to predict how students are gonna do on their summative before they even get there. So just a little review on formative assessments. I really like this idea as well from Roy Sadler, um, assessment for learning. That's what formative assessments are all about. And this ties back into what we were saying earlier. Where am I going? Where am I now? How can I close the gap between the two? The more assessment capable our students are, the more they're gonna be able to reflect on their learning and answer these questions. The other thing I wanna like remind everybody too with formative assessments, especially now that we're in a blended environment or virtual environment and moving into next year, is we really need to be conscious and cognizant of the levels of questioning or the levels of interaction that the students are having um, with our formative student or formative assessments and with the standards themselves, right? Because the standards are driving our curriculum. So how deeply do the students need to understand the content to perform the task? It, you know, there's informal formative assessments, which are great, but you need to also balance that with you know, some deeper um, learning tasks or deeper learning opportunities to respond um, for students to interact with the material at the level that honestly the students or the standards are requiring them to do. 
Um, just an example, I know that Michael and Jennifer touched on this a little bit with DOK, but just as a, you know, a reference, if you will, because you're going to get this slide deck after this is done. Remember level one, recall and reproduction, level two, those skills, level three, that strategic thinking, and level four um, can't be done in a day because they have to set up a plan, they have to come back, they have to revisit it, they have to revise it. But again, I think that this is an opportunity to be able to really move up the ladder and DOK, even informative assessments to really challenge our students at this time. We also wanted to provide you with some resources for DOK and balloons. Uh, I really like, and if you're familiar with um, Karen Hess and her rigor matrix, I just wanted to show you really quickly how she ties this together. Hopefully you can still see my screen. So we have revised blooms down the left-hand side, and then we have webs and how they intersect and what the expectations are. So this is a great resource as you're kind of thinking about how am I going to construct, build, develop my formative assessments and even your summative assessments in the blended and absolutely in the brick and mortar environment. So there's some couple link or a few links that you'll have access to, and you can always just Google them. All these resources are free online. So in order for our students to become assessment capable, they're going to need feedback, right? So they have to know, how am I doing in relation to my learning target? And we know that providing students with explicit feedback has an effect size of 0.75. So we want to make sure that when we're providing our feedback, that we're not feeding students back, but we're feeding their learning forward. I know that one of my classic mistakes as a teacher was when it was time to give feedback, I red penned up your paper and you went back and you just put in whatever my corrections were rather than reflecting on where your learning was. I also provided feedback on soup to nuts and wasn't hitting the clear learning target. Well, I wanna make sure that my feedback is feeding the learning forward because if nothing results because of my feedback, then I miss the mark, right? So the purpose of the feedback, students need to know we're partners so that I'm going to, I'm going to be your learning partner and I'm going to be providing you feedback and it is not a negative thing. It's something that we do together. We want to think about how often we're giving feedback and we want to have a plan once we set forth our learning target, knowing that um, in our virtual settings, we want to give enough time to make sure learning's occurred, not just here, we've given an activity, now I put a grade in the grade book. And that's the feedback the students get. This is how you did on your grade book. You want to know that we're going to be partners. And I'm going to be checking in regularly. And how I check in and the procedures I use are pivotal to our classroom. When we've moved virtually, if teachers are providing feedback via their Google Docs or their email, students need to be on the lookout that this feedback is coming. It needs to be intentional so that students do not ignore feedback because when they're not accustomed to receiving it, they do ignore it. As I look through my own children's work, I'm saying, oh, your teacher gave feedback. She did where? I, I've never seen that because I'm not alert to it as a learner. It wasn't a procedure I was using in my bricks and mortar classroom. So it became something that was foreign to me in my virtual setting that I would have overlooked if my home instructor wasn't next to me. So this feedback needs to be something that's intentional and it's part of our classroom routine. It's something that happens frequently and as a learner, I've come to expect it. We love effective feedback and when we think about a shooting machine. When, when a kid goes to, um, to practice their basketball and they go to one of these shooting machines, which I used to go to a gym that had these shooting machines all the time before this outbreak, on this shooting machine, you receive targets. It tells you how many shots you've taken, it tells you how many shots you've made, and then it gives you percentages as you move around the perimeter of the hoop to show you if you're over 50% where you're hot, where's your lucky streak, and where do you need to practice. This kind of ongoing feedback is the exact type of feedback that our students can look forward to in the classroom once we've set up the conditions for it to occur, to occur knowing that when students get on their Zoom calls, a teacher cannot be talking bell to bell, knowing that when we think about that lesson plan format that we set forth at the beginning of this presentation, that there is a piece always for feedback, as well as there's a piece for the work, feedback for the work that you're asking me to do when I'm working on my own. 
feedback is valuable as long as there's time to act. If it's already over and I get feedback, it's a waste of energy. So feedback has to allow me as a learner the time I need to reflect on where I'm at and where I need to go or what correction, course corrections I need to make to get back on target. When a teacher's providing feedback, again, timing is of the essence. When I receive it as quickly as possible to the learning that I presented, it is going to be more meaningful and relevant. Especially the younger our students are, if it is not in a timely fashion, they might not even recall what the learning was if the feedback didn't come in a timely manner. I'm gonna be kind and I'm gonna recognize something amazing that you did because all of our learners present something that has gone well. I'm going to be specific and bite size about the course correction I want you to make. And I wanna make sure the feedback is helpful, meaning that it feeds forward your learning. Again, knowing feedback is not an event, it is something that's going to be an ongoing cycle within our classroom. All right, so here's an example that we have for you um, that gives us almost a sentence stem for giving that feedback. So I want you all to be able to insert your learning intention. So we'll need to review, insert your content there. Knowing that students quickly learn um, in the testing cycles that we have, that evaluations become part of their grade. So we want students to think about how we can stop and reflect on where we're at so that when it's time for that summative assessment, it's not a big deal. I already have this. It shouldn't be a stressful thing that I'm worrying about because I know where I've been all the way along the way and I knew the summative event was coming and I know pretty much how I'm gonna do. When I was a principal back in a school building, we talked a lot about our results on assessments, our state assessments are not going to be a surprise to us because we're going to know where everybody is along the way. We're going to be able to have predict um, how the outcomes before they occur because we were that tight with our feedback and assessment procedures. So given the blended learning environment, we thought we would introduce some teacher strategies for providing this feedback virtually. And there are many, and we have, like I said, many um, resources we wanna share, but we have to be timely in this, in this hour. So we're gonna highlight a couple as we kind of move through this. But a couple things that you might need to consider that would be different. So we have to consider now, we have to train our students um, on the expectations of checking their email and checking their Google Classroom for that feedback and their Google Docs so they can see the feedback of, that they're getting from the teachers so then they can apply it to the, their learning. Chris, Conferencing I would, also, during, I would add that if you're a younger student too, as we set up our parent expectations moving forward, if we know students are going to need assistance, as a parent, I need to know what the expectation is for me to support with this feedback, um, when it's coming, how it's gonna be administered, what our next steps are. Absolutely. So the other thing you need to consider too, because we're, you know, a lot of teachers, we're having office hours, we're offering these opportunities, but what does that look like? What are the expectations during these, you know, office hours when we're holding a conference? What scaffolds, and this is gonna be really important regardless on the age range, what scaffolds or expectations are you or we providing um, to have students gain access to their feedback? So really setting up scaffolds for them to be successful so they know how to look, find, and use their feedback. And then how do we facilitate a conference virtually with multiple students in a small group? If we're doing anything um, you know, in a small group learning environment or we've given, uh, an assignment to small groups. What could a conference look like when we're having that? And then what form will the feedback come in? And that kind of you know, makes the point what I was just talking about with that. So I'm really big on routines and protocols and baking that into your culture so your students know what to expect. And I think when we're talking about conferencing, emailing, all the Google Suite and these other grading platforms, if we set that expectation in advance, then I think the students will be able to be more successful with it. So we also came up with these checkpoints in the blended and learning environment because in the classroom we see them every day and we have opportunities if they're doing an extended assignment to really intervene and correct the course that they're on to get them back on track towards the intended learning intention. In a virtual environment, much more difficult. So we're suggesting that we you know, have these check-ins, have brief conference after students have chosen a topic, provide written feedback, 
especially if they're older, have written paragraph supporting why their topic is relevant and researchable. Having a brief conference or providing written feedback after students have developed a work plan or an outline. Having a brief conference or providing written feedback on drafts of written reports, charts, material, materials, excuse me, or other components. So just so they don't get way off course, and then it's a lot harder to correct it later and they're not meeting um, your intended outcome. With that same idea, um, we really wanna make sure that the students can make um, the connection between the feedback they're receiving and the improvement on their learning. One way to do that is through the uh, conference scenario. So we've come up with some questions that we've borrowed and then we've kind of taken, this is a little bit from Brookhart and then we've kind of molded it around a little bit with some of our own ideas. So where am I going? And then the expected evidence the student would share, um, you know, their learning intention and your success criteria that you have developed. How am I doing? And then they would provide progress towards the learning goals to the student work samples aligned to the learning intention and the success criteria. So not only are they you know, monitoring their own progress, you're able to have this check-in to see where they're at. So you're both are really in tune with where the student is and their learning. And like Kelly mentioned earlier, it, it really needs to be a relationship between the two in order for them to utilize this feedback and improve their learning. And then where to next, so the contents and skills yet to be learned or ways to deepen their learning um, to formative assessments and success criteria. And then what is my contribution? Students explain or share evidence of how they contributed to move their learning forward. And this is a conversation that, that I honestly had this morning. I was telling Kelly about this before we came on with my daughter and I have other series of questions that parents can have um, that we're gonna share with you with conferences with their students. I think Michael and Jennifer also mentioned it, but you know, one of the things that you can really do that parents like to do too um, is ask your students what you learned today and why you learned it. Not what you did, but what you learned and why you learned it. And so we've taken that a step further now. And I asked my daughter today, you know, how was your learning today? And I have her elaborate on that beyond what were you learning and why you learned it? What moved your learning forward for you? And then you put that in terms, you know, depending on their age range of how she can or he can understand what you're asking. What didn't work for you? So they can elaborate on the areas that they're struggling on or in. And again, you can use these questions with your students or the parents can use these questions with their students. And where are you stuck in your learning is another one and let them elaborate that because that provides an entry point for you as a teacher, but also for the parent, especially because we're relying so much on parents to support us right now. And then what are your next steps? So that plan really, you know, advocating for themselves as an assessment capable learner of, these are gonna be my next steps so I can be successful in this, just like little Sarah was. So we have been talking with many teachers in the field and everyone is feeling overwhelmed with all the variety of resources that are available to us, uh, most of them related to technology. I was conferencing with a principal this morning and he said, I don't want to know about any more resources. I cannot take another resource to my teachers. And we totally agree with you. And we think about this as the same way we think about prioritizing our learning intentions, that we would prioritize two tools that we are going to use and we're going to get to know how they work and put them into our classroom. After the first trimester, we might decide to adopt two more tools depending on where we're at, but do not try to blitz yourself or overwhelm yourself with things so that you end up doing nothing. That's how, what happens to me. If I become too, too over, wanting to be this overachiever, I end up not finding out what works for me. So there are low tech ways to provide active feedback to our students when they enter our virtual environments with us, whether it be through hand signals, response cards, use of the chat box, or polls um, within our Zoom, or polls everywhere can be embedded into your presentations. So, we're going to show you on the next slide um, an active feedback paper that's available to you in your Google file that you'll receive at the conclusion of the day. This comes from the work of Anita Archer. She has a feedback paper so that when we're talking to students on Zoom, when we're asking a call, students can put their feedback paper up, they can put their hand, is this a yes, a no? Is this an agree, disagree question? Do I have answer choices one to four? Or is this a true and false? Now this paper might be unwieldy for you and you think I'm not gonna be able to get my kids to use this paper, it's too much. So we can take it into different 
uh, different mediums as well. We can use index cards where I'm asking a question, students are putting up their index cards to show where they're at, agree, disagree. They can hold them there. And I can even take a picture so that I know where everybody's at related to what they were thinking. And I can call on students to tell me, Chris, why did you agree with the statement that was made? Tell me, tell me what your evidence is. Knowing that when we're asking students to respond virtually, wait time is more critical than it's ever been. We need time for processing, knowing that we cannot use a partner. Now, we can use our chat box, and our chat box can be used as a way for students to process their information to everyone. But we would caution you when you're setting up your Zoom call or your Google Hangout, if there is a chat box function, you would disable the private chats because those are chats that you cannot gain a recording of at the end of your session. The chats to everyone you have record of so you know what students put what out in the chat box so that can become part of your formative assessment. So when we're using the agree, disagree protocol and why, we would ask a question. We'd give that wait time again, give you time to think about it or maybe write about it. We would have you hold up your response, whether it be an index card or it could be a colored card. You could do red and green post-it notes, whatever you, tools you've set up for your students to be successful with. And then we ask students to process if they agree, disagree, chat box, or I can have students unmute and I can call on them. All right, um, here are some examples of questions that would be framed in a way we don't, that would possibly spark discussion like all rectangles are squares, plywood isn't a natural resource, Ben Franklin was a good American. So thinking about questions that would um, help students to engage in a response, just like we did for you when we gave the example of Chris in the rubric, is this person assessment capable or not? There was a gray line on that that would lead to some discussion. We can also use things like fist to five when we're trying to gain an understanding of where everybody is. Hold your fingers up in your square right now so that I know where you're at, so that I'm able to make adjustments. And again, I use low tech, take a picture of that screen so that you have record of where everybody's at related to their understanding so that you could possibly group later and follow up. We're gonna take a look at a video. It's, a, it's one that we've, some of us have seen many times called My Favorite No. While we're watching this teacher, we want you to think about her feedback. Is it timely? What is the evidence? And what conditions has she set in the classroom for her students to receive this feedback so that it's non-threatening, it's not calling anybody out? Is the feedback that she's giving clear? Um, and it, will it enhance uh, students' processing of their math information as they move forward? Hi, my name is Leah Alcala. I teach eighth grade math, and this is my warm up routine that I do with my students almost every day. I call it my favorite no. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. Your warm-up is on the board. I'm going to hand out your index cards. I put a warm-up problem on the board. Hand out index cards to all the kids. Have them write their answer. I collect it, and then I sort it. And I say yes, no, yes, no. And I look for my favorite wrong answer, or my favorite no, and we analyze that. Four minutes to work on it. Everyone makes mistakes. We're gonna see your mistakes, you're gonna see my mistakes. But a mistake is your opportunity to share with me how much you understand. And if I don't know that you don't know something, I need to teach you before the test. The test is too late. And this is a great spot for me to teach you. Make sure your name is on your card, put your pencil in your pencil slot, and pass your cards to the center. I started my warm-up routine to replace clickers that a lot of classes are buying. So that was a clicker for each student. You ask a question, they lock in an answer. And then you look at your computer screen and you know what percentage of your students understand the problem. 
Well, we didn't have the money for that, so instead... Okay, here we go. I thought, well, what if I gave everyone index cards, collected them real quick with their answers already written on it, and then I can just sort them as quick as possible yes. and find out what percentage of my kids know the answer. No. Yes. Costs 40 cents instead of 15 thousand dollars yes so we have quite a few yeses and some very interesting no's one two three four. i then took that a step further something i couldn't do with clickers seven look at the ones who are getting it wrong how far are they from getting it right and showing that work to the other kids okay my favorite no someone wrote this I say it's my favorite no because I want the kids to first of all recognize what they're about to see is wrong and I want them to recognize that there's something good in the problem. Like there's a mistake, but it's my favorite no because Equals. it showed some good math. So that's the wrong answer, but they did some things that I love. What in that problem am I happy to see? We always talk about what's right first, so that if it's any student's work, they are like, oh, I did do that right. What There's a mistake, but the mistake didn't ruin the whole thing. What do I like about this problem? Gavin. Well, um, they distributed both um, with the 4x and the negative 2. Very nice. And what Today's lesson was on factoring. So I needed to make sure they understood how to distribute. They distributed. And what what lets you know that they distributed? David? Uh, how there are no more parentheses. There are no more parentheses. And they didn't just drop the parentheses. So they're asked to distribute a term with a variable. They're asked to distribute twice. They're asked to distribute a term with a negative sign, which is often a very common mistake that kids make and my students do not like I have three years of CST data now to show that one mistake my students do not make is distributing a negative which is amazing because they used to all the time distributing negative 2 to negative 6 is positive 12 and that was one mistake I was absolutely looking for and I did not see which made me very happy not until the very end as we've gone over different sections of the problem that are right that I will then ask okay now what is incorrect what does this person not understand where's the mistake if I get a third of my class raising their hand ready to tell me the mistake that it's pretty high engagement at that point Mia very nice this 4x times 2x multiplies to 8x squared. Can someone convince me of that? How do we know that 4x times 2x is 8x squared? My low level students are very engaged. They feel like they're not getting penalized for being wrong. They're not being made fun of. I'm not looking at them. No, there's no peer pressure at this point. But they're like, wow, that's my mistake. And now I understand. It's very comforting. I mean, I feel very with my kids at all times. I'm not surprised by what they don't know. They're not surprised by what they don't know. It's how it should be. It creates more of a dialogue with me and them. So I'm, I'm gonna read something from the chat box that Lisa says to us. She said, the timing is good. Um, it's kind because the individual who got it wrong is not identified and what's right is identified as well. It's specific because it looks at the individual item that is incorrect and it's helpful because the learning is taking place as they analyze the error. I love that they start with the pos positives and then there are multiple students who can be teachers. And I think Lisa summed up the things that were right with that lesson. I would also, um, add to it that the teacher knew exactly what she was looking for. She knew her learning target and her outcome. Um, when she gave the problem, she knew what she was looking to reinforce so she could pick her right favorite no. And she's clearly got that procedure in place that she was extremely confident. So that procedure can be worked a variety of different ways as you're first learning it. I know that I might I need time to sort my problems, so I might offer it as an exit ticket or a closing lesson 
uh, closing component to my lesson to reintroduce in the morning for my retrieval as this is what we closed with and here's my favorite note. All right, so with opportunities to respond, just kind of to calibrate again here, it includes any strategy or activity or task that makes the student um, thinking visible and allows both the teacher and the learner to observe the learning progress. So if you're familiar with Anita Archer, we were just uh, with her yesterday, I believe, if you were there as well, then you heard her talk about opportunities to respond and how important it is to provide those as much as possible. Now there's some data out there that suggests, you know, you should be doing it, I think three times per minute and like there's some other stuff. But again, the whole idea is just to make sure that you are routinely checking for understanding throughout the learning process. So I know we talked about low tech ways and things you have been working with um, in the brick and mortar environment and how you could take those into a blended. Now we, we have listed several here. Obviously we're not gonna be able to um, highlight or step each one of these out, but we wanted to have them as resources uh, for you when you go back and you have the deck and you can look at it. Um, so we have things for entrance and exit tickets, checks for understanding and reflecting on my learning. And of course, some of these can go in different categories. Um, we just try to categorize them as best as possible so you would have examples. Knowing that you would not use all of those mediums to make yourself crazy, you would pick yeah. two to do well. Someone right. asked in the chat box, how do we replicate my favorite no virtually? So as we work through these tools, I'm wondering if something will resonate with that participant um, to mm -hmm. pair up with my favorite no. Perfect. So again, with the entrance and exit ticket, if you think about an instructional framework and the framework that um, Kelly provided at the beginning of how a blended environment would go in a synchronous Zoom classroom, um, you want to make sure your time taken to introduce or summarize a lesson. We're very, very familiar with the entrance and exit ticket, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it can absolutely be done in a blended learning environment. Your do nows, your warm ups um, that you might be doing, as well as your exit tickets. And, I think that there's opportunities and I'm gonna go over a few here in a second. So when we're talking about checks for understanding, you should almost be able to predict, and Kelly mentioned this and so did I earlier, um, how your students will do on the summative. And that is you know, so important when we think about um, as we're working with our students, making sure that we have students complete. Um, and this first, I'm gonna go over this, I'm gonna back up just for a second. I know we're getting short on time, so I feel like I'm rushing, but I wanna make a point or two here. Uh, making sure that we have we are having students complete what we're making them complete is tied to the standard we are trying to teach for mastery so we go back to that mastery model that we looked at earlier on and making sure that that is all tied together and then checking in frequently allows the instructor to know how students are progressing and then the last one is probably i think the most important for this is check checking for understanding allows the teacher to adjust instruction based on student results now you know, it's so important not just to follow, obviously we wanna follow our scope and sequence and what we're doing, but we have to allow the students and their feedback to inform and drive our instruction. So if we're getting feedback that we need to take a different direction, then we need to respect that from our students and take that direction. We know we have content to cover and we know we're on a time frame, but we have to work with our students and they're giving us the feedback we have to honor that and then we have to do something with that feedback and the final component is reflecting on student learning we know that reflection has got to be part of our assessment cycle and i'm going to leave it at that it is not something that we reflect when we get our summative grade but it is something that is ongoing and the teacher intentionally provides opportunities for the learner to reflect on where they're at how they're doing and their next steps so we're gonna head right into entrance and exit tickets with two possibilities. On the next slide, we provided you with, um, go to the next slide, Chris, um, some Zoom quick links because we're asked quite frequently when we conclude our sessions, um, Michael and Jennifer both used polls in their session. How do you create a poll? Zoom polls are very easy to create. You can create them when you're in your meeting on the spot before the students come. You could create a poll, it takes a few minutes or you can set it up while you're scheduling your meeting. Polls are only activated when your school district has purchased beyond the basic package. The basic package does not include polls, but the packages after that do. If your school district hasn't purchased the package, that's okay. You can use polls everywhere and embed a link um, within your virtual classroom. 
or you could send it out ahead of time. Um, polls Everywhere has different features than the Zoom poll as you're able to figure out who submitted what in Polls Everywhere where you cannot do that um, as a Zoom feature. On the next side, we have Padlet for you. Padlet is free for three Padlets. So knowing that we use Padlet in a lot of our presentations, many times we'll erase a Padlet and create a new one, but it is a paid subscription and it's very easy to operate. So it is something that might be worth investigating with your principal. It is an online bulletin board discussion board. So on this particular example that Chris is showing you, this is a teacher who wanted students to have a discussion. So the teacher put up the questions and then students respond underneath the questions. So they're like threads that build on the wall. It's a great visual for you to use for formative assessment. There was one other example. Um, students were asked here about their earth system and their learning. They're asked to write down two things um, that confuse them about today's lesson. So there's another formative check where students can write on um, the online bulletin board. A teacher once asked me, well, what if someone copies the answer next to a student when I'm trying to check for understanding? And there's two ways that you can take that. You could follow up with that student to say, I noticed that you um, use someone else's words, or you could also look at uh, someone's using extra practice to find the right answer <laughs> and learn it themselves. Finally, you can create a virtual bulletin board that allows students to um, paste up what quadrant they're in related to their learning. You can't see on this picture because we couldn't get it to translate into color, but the dots on this particular uh, poster chart paper are colored with green. If you're in the green quadrant, you're saying I can teach it or explain it to someone else. If you're in the blue quadrant, if you're using a blue sticky, you say, I understand for myself. A yellow being, I'm trying, but I still need help. And red is, I need help. You don't, if, if you, this um, seems overwhelming on a virtual level, this can also be accomplished through a Google form. We have weighed in as consultants on many surveys that have this as an option choice on where are you at related to how you can facilitate a Zoom call. So with Checks for Understanding, we also have several different um, examples to share with you. We're going to, if, you know, we have just a few minutes left. I, hopefully you can stay on for about five minutes past um, the intended schedule time. And I think that we'll be able to wrap this up. But Flipgrid, Note Catcher, Graphic Organizers, Online Discussions, and Expert Group Investigations. So here are some resources. If you're not familiar with Flipgrid, it's another free resource um, that you can use with your students. Um, and we have a getting started guide and we have some blog posts. It's very, very user friendly. Um, to start I want up. to add in here that this, um, this slide comes right from one of our consultants, Stephanie D. Michelle. She's a technology consultant and she's offering free virtual technology workshops. Um, to interested participants that are really awesome and user-friendly if that's something that you wanted to explore. Oh, perfect. So we have a, a Flipgrid example that we're going to share with you. Um, they can help you assess what a student knows about a concept. This one was regarding pitch and how fast an object vibrates. My homemade instrument sounds like a guitar. The pitches depend on the size of the rubber band. The bigger the rubber band, the lower the pitch. The smaller the rubber band, the louder the pitch. What's great about Flipgrid is not only do you have evidence that you can learn, uh, drum you and can also, um, students can watch other students and you're learning right there. When I'm watching somebody else in their video, I'm also learning um, something that I might not have known. So a lot of times, you know, we do small group instruction. It's such a vital part of a brick and mortar environment. And how would we facilitate small groups and small group work in a blended environment? So we added a note catcher is what is entitled. It's a Google Doc, it's very simple to make. And I've included, or we've included the template that you'll be able to go back, make a copy, um, edit however you please. But it really allows you um, to have breakout rooms with your students where they can work in small groups on a Google Doc. So it's not a Zoom. As the teacher, you can listen. And by listening, I mean you can watch them put information into their note catching documents. And then as the teacher, you can provide feedback efficiently by inserting comments immediately to help them. And if they're struggling to get started, which 
as you know, in classrooms, in small groups, sometimes they struggle to get started. So this allows you an opportunity to intervene on that so they can, so you can help them. And I just want to show you quickly what it looks like. And then you can just, and this is all set up for you. So all you have to do is just, you know, create it however you want. You can have as many discussion questions as you want, however many groups that you want, and then you share that with your students and then you'll be able to enter into that document and see what they're doing. So that's an, it's sort of a low tech because we're utilizing Google Classroom, but I think it's extremely effective way to um, do breakout rooms. Um, graphic organizers. So I love graphic organizers. The one thing on Google Classroom, I feel that, you know, I want to make sure what the learning intention is when we're assigning or we're providing or giving graphic organizers to our students. So instead of just giving it for them to complete it, how is it tied into the learning intention? And how do the students know that it's tied into the learning intention? How will students show that they learned it? So how does this all link together again, back to that learning intention, success criteria, and then with the opportunity to respond? And then what strategy or graphic organizer will help students achieve and demonstrate the intended outcome? Graphic organizers are great, but it's not a one size fits all. So you have to make sure that you're making the right choices um, to get the intended outcome. This is another example of checks for understanding. So with these online discussions, you can introduce a topic in a Zoom and then post the discussion topic or photo for the students to respond or evaluate. Um, and it's a quick write. It's just a virtual quick write is all that it is. And you could use one of the online platforms like Poll Everywhere or Padlet, but you could also just use your Google Classroom and a Google Doc and then just post it as an assignment. And then students can work independently or they can work in small groups. But what I really like about this is that, you know, students can take their time and they can think about it. They can refine their thinking. They can compare their thoughts to their peers, which I also really like Padlet and Pull Everywhere because they can compare their thinking to their peers and readjust their thinking. And then expert group investigations. So again, in a blended learning environment, we want to make sure that we are providing the richest opportunities, you know, for our students, the best content, the best curriculum. So with expert group investigations, you can give small groups various topics to research, and then they can share their ideas and questions on a Google Doc. I'm sure many of you probably have done this already in a class where everybody is contributing on a Google Doc. Well, we could absolutely do that in a blended learning environment. And then they could go and create, you know, they're learning or demonstrate their learning through um, Gloxer, or Prezi, or any of the Google Suite opportunities there. So the final component before we close today is providing students with opportunities to reflect on their learning. So the first thing we're going to show you is a single point rubric. The single point rubric is something that is very focused and specific. It can be even smaller than this four point rubric that we're showing you, but it probably shouldn't go over four points. It is different from a holistic rubric, obviously, because it is being very targeted on what you're looking for as a student crafts a response or a piece. It also provides space for the student and the teacher to write about where they're at. Did I meet or exceed the standard how, or is there an area that I need work? So there's a reflection tool brought into to this, um, this tool that can also be used outside of writing, but we had an art teacher in one of our sessions talk about how she was gonna adapt the single point rubric to provide feedback on art. One other thing I just wanna interject here, we get a lot of questions as consultants, and, I'm, and I asked it all the time as when I was in the classroom too, what is proficient, right? What is, it, what is it to be proficient or what does proficient look like? A single point rubric shows you what a proficient student or where they are at or what they can do. And that's why I really like the single point rubric as well. And your success criteria is built right in there, right? Yeah. That you would be yep. talking about ahead of time. So response journaling is really um, just as it sounds, it's students responding to something. And this can be done in so many different mediums besides writing, you could, students can submit pictures. Today, um, I know of a student who was asked to submit a picture, uh, a song or a poem related to an assignment um, to show evidence of learning as well as we've had 
um, participants and workshops, and I think kids would enjoy this, submit a meme related to today's learning, and they come up with very creative things. So students always need to be responding to whatever the learning outcome is or the lesson so that we make sure the takeaways are exactly what we designed. And here you see the quick checks just that you saw at the beginning um, of our session here today where students are weighing in on where they're at. And again, knowing this is a paper pencil for a brick and mortar, this can be done electronically through a variety of mediums, um, including a Google form so that students are reflecting on wh where are you from this week's learning. All right, and we always want students to be tracking their progress. So talking about that learning intention or that goal in this particular example, what they know related to that learning intention and goal, proof of their learning and reflection so they can be like Sarah, what are their next steps? Knowing that these things are not natural to students and that we have to train them and provide them with supports and organizers for them to start um, attaching this to part of their routines as a learner. And finally, the three sentence wrap up, and we're gonna use the one sentence wrap up with you today. At the end of the lesson, have students summarize their learning in three sentence or less. They can share summaries, submit summaries. If you're in the classroom, they can share their summaries with a partner. So on that note, today we'd like you to use the chat box and write a summary, 15 words, no more, no less. Well, that's a little bit of a stretch. What would it be about today's learning? Who wants to start us off in that chat box? Someone is saying assessment is going to be very interesting for a blended classroom and a challenge for me personally. And I think Lisa's a kindergarten teacher. I would agree with that. Uh, it's imperative in this new normal to continue to assess kids and help them in their learning. Uh, to communicate expectations and provide timely feedback to help students meet those expectations. I agree with you, Ed. Assessment is key to understanding your students and where they need to go in their education. Clear goals are critical, Ann says, and so is success criteria. And it's important to measure learning and not compliance. Patty, I couldn't agree more. And on that note, we're seven minutes over, so we're going to wrap up. Um, reminding you all that you'll receive an email from Ronnie, our administrative assistant. In, in your tools today, you'll get the note catcher, get the active response sheet, our presentation, a copy of today's comments for awesome ideas that we receive from our colleagues, and a video of today's session. Please remember to follow us on Twitter at ESC underscore curriculum. And we just newly published um, offerings through our organization that'll be free this summer for your continued learning. So we hope to see you all around again and we thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna hang out on this call for anybody who wants to have uh, follow up dialogue with us. So thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone. Hey Chris, did you get your bike out yet? <laughs>